Nobody's gonna beat Kennedy in 64 with all the money in the world. Suppose Kennedy don't run in 64. <laughs> Not a chance. Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Could you please uh, start by uh, telling us your full name and what do you do for a living? Well, my name is Eric Hamburg and I'm a film producer and writer. books actually one in particular that you're familiar with about the making of JFK and Nixon and then I've produced a few movies mostly with Oliver Stone this is my last press conference thank you good day Go up 23 to 21. Man, oh man, did they nail him? And it doesn't look like Cherubini's getting up. Fuck! My original training is as a lawyer, as an attorney, and then I worked in Washington in the political world, and I worked for Senator John Kerry, who you know later ran for president and then became Secretary of State, and a couple of other people that I worked for. So. So that was my background. And then from there, I somehow ended up in Hollywood and tried to make some sort of political films. Did you always, in the back of your mind, wanted to be in the movie business? Or did, did you, did, was, was that something that interested you, beside the fact that you were a lawyer and you were working in politics? Yeah, I had always had a side of me that wanted to do something creative. And, uh, I had always loved film, especially like when I was in high school and college, I would watch a lot of foreign films, like Italian films, you know, the Italian neorealists and people like even Pasolini and Fellini and all of those people, you know, and then, uh, and of course the French New Wave, Godard and Truffaut and so forth. And, and some American films too you know, that I really enjoyed. I just, last night, my son and I watched Bonnie and Clyde, which was a great film of that era. So I'd always wanted to do that, and and it just seemed like this was the right opportunity. And you know, I had never, I had no formal training in film. I had never gone to film school, and that was probably a disadvantage. But you know, and, and as you said, I didn't really have any connections in Hollywood. But I sort of had a lot of ideas, and I had some connections in Washington, of course. And so I made the most of all of that, and. And uh, it was kind of like being thrown into the deep end of a swimming pool and you have to learn how to swim, you know, when I got to Hollywood. What will you want to say to people about this picture? <laughs> oh, I, I, think what, I think the film should speak for itself. I mean, that's the best thing I could say for it. I mean, I dedicated it to the Vietnam vets. Uh, I hope they liked it. And uh, I hope people go to, 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 to see what the war was really like. That's, you know, that's the statement, and, and once you see it, you, can, you have to think about it for yourself and see what, think about what you think about war, think about what it really is, as opposed to the fantasy comic book stuff of Top Gun. 
when did you first met, met Oliver Stone and what was your first impression about him? Well, when I first met him actually was when I was working for John Kerry in the Senate. This was about 1987, I believe. And Platoon had just come out the year before and of course was very popular and won some Academy Awards and so on. And, that was really what put Oliver on the map, so to speak, you know, in Hollywood or even in the broader culture. So when I met him, was at an event in Washington organized by a group called Vietnam Veterans of America. And so Oliver was being honored for his film and John Kerry, who was also a Vietnam veteran, was being honored as what they call legislator of the year for you know, the things that he had done in the Congress. So we met Oliver there, just sort of by chance, you might say, but we got, I, I of course had seen Platoon by then and liked it very much. And so we got to talking with him and he was very friendly. And I just, my impression was that he was a very intelligent, thoughtful guy, very serious. And, uh, uh, you know, I didn't, really think too much of it, but, but then a few years later, when I heard he was making a film about the JFK assassination, I got back in touch with him because I was also very interested in that subject. And that's really how our relationship began, you might say. I repeat, a shooting in the motorcade in the downtown area. The president's car is now going past me. Now, Charlie had a very high rate of... When JFK was killed, I was only about 10 years old, so I was in still elementary school. But I, I remember, I lived in California then, and I remember quite vividly my teacher coming to the classroom and being very upset and announcing this. And, and then they sort of excused us all, and we went out on the playground. And, you know, it was very confusing at the time. And I remember my father was very upset about the whole thing. And, you know, and then of course, likewise later when Bobby Kennedy was killed. The ghost of John F. Kennedy confronts us with the secret murder at the heart of the American dream. He forces on us the appalling questions of what is our constitution made? What is our citizenship and more our lives worth? What is the future of a democracy where a president can be assassinated under conspicuously suspicious circumstances while the machinery of legal action scarcely trembles? It was one of those events that's kind of a turning point in history, uh, regardless of who actually did it or who was behind it, which is another question. But just the fact that he was killed changed the whole course of history. And, you know, of course, he was a figure that, uh, represented change and hope long before Obama appropriated those terms. You know, Kennedy really symbolized that. And, and uh, uh, you know, he wanted to end the Cold War and to really transform American society in a lot of ways. And a lot of that came to an end when he was killed. And then in addition to that, you know, after he was killed, uh, President Johnson escalated the whole Vietnam War, you know, beyond all recognition. Kennedy, when Kennedy was president, there were very few Americans in Vietnam and he was pulling them out. After Johnson came in, he put a half a million or more troops into Vietnam and of course the war dragged on for years and many thousands, if not millions of people were killed. Just get me elected. I'll give you a damn war. In that document, lay the Vietnam War.
you know, the Warren Commission was appointed by President Johnson to investigate the assassination. And a lot of people believe that it was sort of a whitewash and they weren't really interested in finding the truth. They just wanted to blame the whole thing on one person, Lee Harvey Oswald. The reason for that being that Johnson was afraid that if it, if it was, you know, it was made to look, I mean, Oswald had lived in the Soviet Union. So if it, if it looked like the Soviet Union was behind this, then it could lead to a war, maybe even a nuclear war, and he didn't want that. So that part is understandable. But so what happened was there were probably several million pages of documents that had been generated in the course of this investigation, which were sealed and kept secret. They were supposed to be kept secret for 75 years. And so, of course, we wanted to get those things released. And so I, as I say, I had been interested in this subject, you know, even before the JFK movie was made. And I had been working in the Congress on a bill to try to open up the files, but we weren't getting very far because it was considered sort of a taboo subject. Nobody wanted to touch it and so on. And then when Oliver's movie came along, that blew the whole thing wide open. And, you know, it attracted so much press and publicity and public interest that, to make a long story short, we were able to get this bill passed right before the 1992 election. And then President Bush signed it just a week before the election. And uh, so as a result of that, over a period of a number of years, you know, many thousands or even millions of pages were released, although some are still being withheld to this day by the CIA and other agencies. But, but a lot of material was released, and that was a big breakthrough in this case. So it was no surprise a movement began in this House, in the Senate, and in public to open those files to permit us to try to find out the truth we had so long been denied. So that was, to me, that just illustrated the power of film, of cinema, of what it can do. I mean, even just beyond just seeing a movie and being moved by it emotionally, this had a huge political impact. So I thought to myself, you know, I'd really like to work with Oliver and make more political movies. And I wrote to him and he was open to it. And I came out to LA and met with him and one thing led to another. And that's how we ended up making the Nixon movie. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight, I'm taking an action unprecedented in the history of this office. I had no knowledge of the cover-up until John Dean told me about it. So I think I'm going to throw up. Richard Nixon is probably the most, if not the most dramatized president in popular culture, in movies, in novels, in television. It's certainly one of the most dramatized uh, presidents. Uh, I mean, why, why do you think that after all these years, after, you know, after many years uh, of his resignation and Watergate, we are still fascinated by this character? And what, what do you think is that makes him such a compelling character for drama, for, for these kinds of fictions? Well, I think the way we looked at it was it was sort of like a Greek tragedy or a Shakespearean tragedy. And I think, you know, his rise and fall. And I think that's really why Oliver went, the big reason why he went with Anthony Hopkins, because he was a Shakespearean actor and had done that on the stage in England. So, you know, so there's that aspect, but there's also the aspect of Nixon as a almost comic character. It's very easy to caricature him. Did you catch that picture of you in the news last week? You were standing in a crowd on Fifth Avenue and you were looking straight ahead and everyone else was looking the other way. Like you just farted or something. <laughs> it, said, it said, who remembers Dick Nixon? Unbelievable. I was screaming. Yeah, that was hilarious, Martha. The image of Nixon, and for that matter of Watergate, has become very oversimplified in people's minds. 
And, you know, and this was really an attempt to dig deeper and to really explore the reasons behind it, both the psychological forces driving Nixon and also the, the greater political forces, which we call the beast, that propelled him to this position and then brought him down. You know, so it was, it was both his own, you know, character flaws that brought him down, but it was also the greater political system, which he was beginning to challenge in some ways. Yeah, man, Jake. You're not threatening me, are you? Presidents don't threaten Jack. They don't have to. There's an aspect of making a film, you know, even about somebody as sort of as bad as Nixon that you want to, especially as an actor, like an Anthony Hopkins, but also as a screenwriter or director, you want to find something that you can relate to in that person. You want to find the humanity in them somewhere that you can draw on and, you know, what we call it empathy. You know, I uh, keep thinking of my old man tonight. He was a failure too. Not a failure, Dick. You know how much money he had in the bank when he died? Nothing. You're so damned honest. One of the most interesting books, I think, on Nixon is by Fawn Brody. Mm -hmm. It's called Richard Nixon, The Shaping of His Character. And it's sort of the first book to kind of look at him from a psychological point of view. And we relied on that quite a bit, actually, in making the film, especially the parts about his brothers and his mother and father and so on. I can't. You must. This law school, it's a gift from my brother. You have to die for me to get it. Something has to come of this. It's meant to make us stronger. He art stronger than Harold, stronger than Arthur. God has chosen thee to survive. What about happiness, Mother? He will find a peace at the center, Richard. Strength in this life, happiness in the next. So then what happened was with the film, you know, we were attacked from both sides because the Nixon family and their sympathizers said, this is character assassination, blah, 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 of Nixon. And on the other side, you know, the very liberal people said, you're being too nice to Nixon. <laughs> so, but because we tried to show both sides of him, you know. And uh, so it's tricky, you know. I mean, sometimes people just want to see things in black and white and they don't want to look at the shades of gray in between. John, sooner or later, Sooner, I think, we're going to learn the lesson that's been learned by everyone who's ever gotten close to Richard Nixon. That he's the darkness, reaching out for the darkness. And eventually, it's either you or him. Your grave's already been dug, John.
there's also a lot of politics in any given Sunday. Right. It's just that it's not in, they're not on the on, on, on the foreground, but you know the, the whole aspect of uh, sports turn into business and entertainment and the ratings and everything. Give me Vincent. Riggerman makes a beautiful move over Julian Washington. What a lousy block, which frees up Watson up the middle. Look at Gates on the back side. Who is on the weak side safety? Stop showing that. All right, we'll be right back with Caps Condition after this word from our sponsors. All right, Caps, they cut to a commercial. You can get up. I think I my back. What we're trying to do in, in any given Sunday is show you not the sort of sanitized corporate spectacle that you see on television on Sundays, but what goes on behind the scenes in the locker room, in the boardroom, you know, in the parties, you know, in the kind of craziness that goes on, the women, the drugs, whatever, sawing up. The hypocrisy, the, 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 the phony showbiz aspect of it all. Yeah. I coach Tony my way. We make less money than 90% of the other teams. I mean, the economics. Oh, just fuck don't the add economics. Up. Your father, you hear me? Your father didn't interfere. He made it That's work. That's because you were a fighter. You had intensity. One of the difficulties was that, you know, we had hoped to have the cooperation of the NFL, the National Football League, and initially they were cooperating. And, sending us videotapes and material. And, but then after they saw the script of the film or learned what it was about, you know, they decided, no, no way, we're not cooperating here. So then we had to change all the uniforms, change the names of the teams, you know, make it all fictional rather than based on real teams. But, you know, despite that, it all worked out. And, Nobody one day and have the whole world know you the next day. Well, I was always a star. Y'all just didn't know about it. <laughs> it ain't the whole world. Two billion people in China ain't never heard of it. Oliver's original choice for the role was was not Jamie Foxx, but it was Puff Daddy or P. Diddy or whatever he's now called, you know, the rapper. Mm -hmm. And I think the studio wanted him because he was very popular in those days and, you know, and so Oliver, you know, brought him in and had him try out and, and he was almost cast for the role, but a couple of things happened. One was, you know, they discovered that he couldn't throw a football properly. I mean, <laughs> Oliver sort of said, you know, he throws like a girl, you know, he doesn't know how to throw. And so that was a big problem. And secondly, you know, he was this big time rapper and he came with a big entourage of people and, you know, with a big ego and sort of like, I'm the big star here. And that was a big turnoff, especially to Al Pacino. Pacino basically said to Oliver, okay, it's either him or me. And so Oliver decided to get rid of Puff Daddy and brought in Jamie Foxx, which was probably a much better choice. You know, and, and Jamie Foxx had played uh, football in high school so he knew how to throw a football and you know what the game was all about he's a good athlete are you saying that black people are being dissed in this league Willie I mean I see what you do you doing them that media spin or whatever that y'all do but let's talk about the facts I mean 70 percent of the people in this league is African-American but how many black coaches do you have very few very few how many black owners none zero right so, and then you know LL Cool J was also cast who was another rapper and you know, he and Jamie had some conflicts. At one point, they got into a fight on set, you know, and Oliver was like saying to the camera, you know, keep rolling, keep filming, <laughs> you know, get this. Because <laughs> it was a real fight in real life. That created a little tension on the set, but uh, you know, I guess he got it under control and everybody cooled down and it was all right. This game has got to be about more than winning. You're part of something here. Lombardi, Tittle, Sammy Bohr, 
Unitas, hundreds of great players, those men on the wall. You're part of that now. And along the way, I want you to cherish it because when it's gone, it's gone forever. I think one of the most incredible scenes in that movie or in any of Oliver's movies is when he goes to give a pep talk in the locker room, you know, and before the, the game. The, the four inches? The... Right, yeah, it's like we fight for that inch. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from you. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's this game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. It's become so iconic. You know, like high school teams play this, you know, in their locker rooms before the game, or, you know, they show it on big screens at basketball games. And... On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. Yeah. We claw with our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's gonna make the fucking difference between winning and losing. Yeah. And he said to me when we made Nixon, he said, this is kind of an older man's film. You know, whereas any given Sunday was much younger, more energetic, more, you know, in your face, you know. And, and that's what makes it fun. His uh, belief is that the climate change problem is so drastic, so, you know, imminent and terrible that, you know, we need to take drastic steps immediately to deal with it and to get away from fossil fuels and find a cleaner energy source. And so he came to the conclusion that that is nuclear power that you know, nuclear power is much more advanced now, much more safe than it used to be in the time of Chernobyl and all that. And that, you know, that that would be the best way. A man doesn't cry. I don't cry. You don't cry. You fight. I think sometimes you have to take risks. You know, sometimes I think to myself, why did I ever come to Hollywood? It was all a big mistake. I should have stayed in Washington. But, you know, I believe in the power of ideas and also in the power of individuals to make a difference. And uh, that's what I tried to do in my small way. And I think that's what Oliver Stone has done through his films. It's up to you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Muchas gracias. <laughs>